It seems that the vaccine that Moderna, um, you know, talked to us about yesterday is much easier to distribute because of the need for refrigeration actually at a lesser level for 30 days. Is this a game changer? I do think that this is going to end up being probably one of the first generation vaccines that is the, the vaccine of choice because everybody was excited about the Pfizer efficacy numbers, but we weren't so excited about the fact that it needed to be stored at minus 70, minus 80 degrees centigrade. The Moderna vaccine, because it can be stored at normal, achievable temperatures that don't pose a major logistical challenge, does make this prospect a little bit easier. It's still going to be daunting, but it is going to be something that is, is much, much more much less complicated when you don't have to think about freezer farms and trying to make sure that the cold chain remains intact. If you look at the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, there are a new generation of vaccines called mRNA. What do we understand about them? What do we know about them? And can they actually change vaccine development forever? I do think this is the case. <clears throat> mRNA vaccines are going to have you know, a major impact, I think, on vaccine development in the future. And these are the first two that we're really seeing in advanced clinical stages. But what they offer is the ability to very elegantly be able to make a vaccine quickly and put it into clinical trials, because all you need to know is the genetic sequence of whatever you're trying to immunize against. And then you can basically print it off and then inject that gene into people. And then your cells start to make that protein and your immune system uh, reacts to it. So the fact that you can do this so quickly may make a lot of vaccines that have been out of reach or have been too expensive because of the cost of, of research and development much, much more uh, within reach. And it could change the way we think about emerging infectious disease outbreaks, infectious disease these outbreaks. And there are also applications for cancer and other uh, other types of vaccines. So, so this really, I think, will jumpstart the mRNA vaccine field. And I think we'll, we'll likely pay a lot of dividends in the future for when it comes to public health and other medical conditions. Um, Dr. Dalja, talk to me a little bit about whether the fact that this is a new vaccine, there will be a lot of misinformation. Will you know, fewer people want to take it, given the very nature of these vaccines that we haven't tried out yet? This is a definite possibility, even for vaccines that have a lot of information. We have people who will be susceptible to misinformation and lies about them. And we have a very vibrant and vocal anti-vaccine movement that is poised to pounce on this vaccine the minute it is approved. So I do think we're going to have to be very transparent about the risks, the safety profile, the, the, the risk-benefit ratio in a way that we really haven't. Because if this vaccine doesn't get into the arms of the world's people, it's not going to be a worthwhile vaccine. So we have to really make sure we get this right. Because during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, we didn't see very great uptake with that vaccine. And it was something that was done using tried and true flu vaccine technology that wasn't new. So this is going to be even a little bit more, uh, more difficult of a communications issue, but we do have to start to be proactive about it. And, and I do think we will get a safe and effective vaccine based on the data that I've seen. But again, th there's just always that issue when you're doing something new in the middle of a pandemic pandemic and this perception that this was rushed uh, versus the, the fact that this is just a, a function of the fact that they used a really innovative technology that allows you to go fast. Uh, how are hospitals coping? Which hospitals and states are actually at near capacity? Well, this, this sort of changes every day, but the ones that we're worried about now are, are still North and South Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, Utah, El Paso, Texas. Uh, that, that's where we're hearing the, the most stress that's going on. And there are likely going to be more. This is going to be roving. Every hospital now in the country is dealing with COVID-19 patients for the most part. And they're dealing with a higher number than they had even during the peak in the spring. So this is something that is not sustainable if we don't get some level of control, just enough to have some breathing room because hospitals are not only taking care of COVID-19 patients, they have to do everything else. They have to take care of heart attack patients and trauma patients and stroke patients. And we don't want that care to be compromised. So we have to get some level of control so that the vulnerable populations are not getting hospitalized. And, and that's what we continue to worry about. That's what flattening the curve is, is, about, is about to me. It's trying to keep it below hospital capacity to a manageable level. And I think we're failing because many states do not have the public health infrastructure to intervene on these cases. And you have a population which is really not listening about the fact that we live in a pandemic and you have to take some common sense precautions. Does that change with the Biden administration? I keep on reading these, frankly, incredible stories in U.S. press of people dying of COVID-19, but not believing they have it. 
I do think it will change with the Biden administration. Uh, but you have to remember that that's, the Biden administration isn't going to take office for over 60 more days. So this train will continue to accelerate. It is going to become harder and harder to stop. But I do think that the plan that's been outlined by the Biden transition team about really investing in testing and rapid testing and in at-home testing, as well as looking at hospital capacity. And I, and I do think also just the simple fact that you wouldn't be getting misinformation, you wouldn't be getting lies, you wouldn't get undermining of experts like Dr. Fauci, you would have the CDC back in the front in the front seat driving this. All of that's going to make a major difference in how the American public think about this pandemic. It's just that we have to wait two months for that. And, and I think there's still a lot of damage that's going to be done between and people are going to die between now and then.